Bada bing, bada bam. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder episode. And today, we're making banana bread. But this is gonna be like the fanciest banana bread that you've ever seen in your life. And we are talking about a highly controversial movie. So controversial. This was on my TikTok feed for weeks at a point. Listen, I know that this movie was heavily talked about. Not even because of the movie itself. Not even because the plot was controversial. But the real life drama surrounding the cast. Olivia Wilde, Florence Pugh, Harry Styles. And I didn't even really get that sucked into the drama, but I did see some weird clips and I was like, what the hell is going on? I need to know. Is the movie a dumpster fire, similar to the press conferences and all the drama surrounding it? But no, the movie was actually not bad. It did provide a pretty twisty end and it had me thinking about it for like a minute afterwards. I was surprised. And it's kind of sad how much the drama overshadowed the movie itself. What's the drama? <laughs> so the drama was like the director of the movie didn't like one of the cast members. One of, uh, Florence Pugh is like the main actress. She's so talented, by the way. Incredible actress. She didn't do any promo for the movie. There was some drama about like some dude that was in the movie. Was he not? He wasn't in the movie, but I, was he supposed to be in the movie? Shia LaBeouf or something? It was crazy. And then at the press conferences, they refused to stand near each other, and it was just really awkward. Like, mm. the whole cast looked just really uncomfortable. Mm. So there's so much drama that they all hate each other. But we're not talking about the drama. Yeah, and then... Which is what we want to hear. No, but I think people know all about this drama. And then at one point, like, text messages were leaked. Like, it was, like, YouTube drama level. Mm. It was bizarre, okay? It was really bizarre. And then somehow it got into salad dressing. Salad dressing? There was salad dressing drama. The producer of the movie, Olivia Wilde, um, was obsessed with, like, had this secret salad dressing recipe. And apparently she was with her husband, but then would make the salad dressing for Harry Styles. And now she's divorced and dating Harry Styles. I don't know if they're still what? together. Bro, it's so what? complicated. It is so complicated. I can't even get into the drama because I don't even know, okay? That's just what I've gathered from like five TikToks. So with that being said, let's jump into the movie. What's the movie? The movie is called Don't Worry Darling. And mm. only knowing about the drama, only knowing the title of the name, I was imagining some sort of like coming of age movie. You guys know how I feel about coming of age movies. I already lived through my coming of age. I don't need to live through this random characters on the screen. It's not something that I want to go through twice. Now this, was not a coming of age movie. It was fascinating and captivating from the get go. There was no part where I got bored or unentertained or zoned out or started multitasking. It was good. So imagine you go to a dinner party with all these other couples. And how many of these couples do you actually think is truly happy in their relationship or happy in their lives? How many of them just fought all the way to the party and now they're just pretending to be happy, to not cause drama, to look like the perfect couple? No how couple. many of them? All of them? Huh? <laughs> Did you say all of them? <laughs> I say no couple is happy. <laughs> so how many of them you think are hiding big secrets from their partners, you know? So you want to cut the banana very lengthwise, perfectly in half. You broke it, honey. I broke it? Yes, you no, broke it. No, no, no. It. It's okay. And then you're going to want to put it this side down into your loaf pan. Oh my god, it looks like a vagina. You don't think it's so good? But that's not enough to <laughs> the top. Okay. You know what I mean? Can't even be a pervert in the comfort of my own home. <laughs> yeah, you got to fill it. Okay, you got to fill it with what? How many of these couples do you think are hiding secrets from each other, you know? That they just haven't found out about the other person. You would say it's a really good percentage. Maybe we're all just cynical and skeptical here, but love is freaking dead. And so are the dinner parties. Well, not this one. The movie opens with a few couples having a dinner party. And afterwards, there's jazz music playing. All the couples are goofing around. The women are holding these, um, these like trays on top of their head. And they're balancing these beer glasses, like whiskey glasses filled with whiskey on top and they're dancing to see which one has the best balance. The guys are sitting on the sofa goofing around, you know, betting on which partner is going to last the longest. Joke's on them. It's always two minutes. It just all seems so wholesome. When the girls sit down to join their husbands, I mean, they all genuinely seem to be lighthearted. Like they're goofing around. They're so giggly. It's like they all just started dating because how can you be in that much love after marriage? But they seem perfect. You probably would think that there is no way that they probably have their own problems at home. But what if they don't? 
Like, literally, what if they are all relationship goals? Go, go, go. Ah! It's the, we went upstairs to do it, guys. This is like a tong hulu. This is crystallized sugar. And we're supposed to put a fat layer of it. It looks incredible. Holy sh That was kind of crazy. We went upstairs on the stove to do it. Because we couldn't do it on the little mixing stove here. So. Take Jack and Alice, our main couple, for example. On their way home, they find this abandoned field. They start doing donuts in the dirt, which sounds bizarre, but it's actually this really cute moment. They have this convertible, and it's just, the whole thing is adorable and cute, and I would probably fall in love if someone did that with me, okay? So, side note, Alice is kind of like um like a Stepford wife, you know? It, it's one of those towns where most of the wives, they wake up early. They do their little morning routine, they do their hair, they do full makeup. They come downstairs, they make breakfast there for their husbands, who are all dressed up in suits before they kiss them goodbye. And then they immediately get to work. They start on their daily list of tasks, which honestly is no easy task, but it's it's cooking, it's cleaning, it's cleaning the bathtub every single day, it's lunch with the girls. Tennis lessons with the girls. There's their Pilates moms, essentially. Only, it seems like this is taking place in the 50s or something. So they have like those olden day TVs. Mm -hmm. They've got like kind of the style of their homes are uh, Palm Springs, mid century modern from the 50s. It's very beautiful. Wait, the movies uh, from this uh, taking place at. That's the thing, in they the don't 50s? really tell you. It almost is the weirdest thing. It's kind of like the 50s, but it almost has a futuristic vibe to it. Mm. So it's weird. It's like cosplaying the 50s. And it's in a town called Victory. The town name is Victory. And they all dress like their housewives from the 50s. Their hair, their makeup, their clothes, their cars are like the pastel colored convertibles. It's very pretty. The movie aesthetic is so pretty, okay? Anyway, you're like, wait, I thought this is a thriller movie. Yeah, so did I, right? This is a straight up horror movie. I'm just kidding. I love stay at home moms, but there's definitely an eerie vibe about the stay at home moms here in this particular town. All the husbands have super secretive jobs. So they all work for the Victory Project in the town of Victory. The only people that are allowed to live in the town of Victory is if their husbands work on the Victory Project. And these husbands can't even talk to their wives about what their project is. It seems like some sort of super secret government project. Are they working on bombs? Explosives? It's giving Manhattan Project. Do you remember? Mm, no. During the war, super secret government mm. project to explore nuclear weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, okay, so I'm just mixing this in with the uh, mashed bananas because bananas are not sweet at all. You should add three cups of sugar. <laughs> That's the only way to eat them, okay? So they all move into this town and the town itself is super mysterious. The number one rule about being a wife or a child or anyone that doesn't work for the Victory Project, like let's say your brother works there, right? You're not allowed to leave the town. You're not allowed to leave the town. It's in the middle of the desert. So Victory is in the middle of the desert, but Victory is beautiful. Everyone has like these, there's community pools. Some mansions have their own pools. There's palm trees everywhere. It kind of gives me Palm Spring vibes. Mm -hmm. So there's almost like this suburban paradise oasis in the middle of a desert. Mm -hmm. So once you leave Victory, it's just dry desert land and you're not allowed to leave because some sort of secret project is out there. And there's there's always these random earthquakes or what sounds like, I don't know, explosions. And at first Alice used to ask Jack about it, but she knew that he would never tell her. He can't tell her. So instead, she just makes sure that he's ready for work every single day and, you know, she loves him a lot. Instead of being excited for him to leave to work so that she can tackle her to-do list or, I don't know, be free of the dude, she wants him to play hooky. She wants him to call out of work so they can cuddle and she can take care of him and they can do it all day. That's what she's begging him to do. Hmm. And I'm begging him to leave. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's begging me to leave. <laughs> but he's all like, sorry, babe, duty calls. And she runs out to bring his lunch to the car where all the other neighbors in the cul-de-sac you see in their identical palm tree covered houses, the wives come out, wave goodbye to their husbands who all drive off in these beautiful pastel colored convertibles. They literally all back out of the driveways at the same time. It's so <sighs> uniform. And then they go in a row. 
They go in a row out of the neighborhood and drive into the desert to go to work. I'm sorry, what? And it's even so wholesome. Like the dudes will be in their sunglasses playing music and they'll flick each other off before driving off. But you know, it's like a bro flick off. Like they don't actually hate each other. They're all best buds, like goofy little boys. It's weird. They start driving away from their suburban paradise and it looks like, I don't know, it just is so interesting. The whole thing is so eerie. And as they're driving, a woman's voice comes on the radio. All Victory Headquarter employees headed to the office. All residents are safe and accounted for. Enjoy the beautiful days, ladies. And it's all like a them. Black Mirror episode. Yes. Huh? So is someone keeping track of all the women in the town? Because that's very creepy. Why do they even care? And each one of the women, they immediately get to work smiling and giggling while they're cleaning the house, going to buy groceries. The bus that this town has isn't even a bus. It's like the trolley. Y'all ever been to the Grove in Los Angeles? It's like that type of trolley. A double-decker open-air trolley with the cutest little bus driver. It's not public transportation. You guys ever been on MARTA? This is not MARTA. It's cute. They take that to go buy groceries. I mean, it's, it's paradise. They even all go take ballet lessons together from a very scary teacher by the name of Shelly, okay? They're straight up terrified when Shelly walks in. And just to give you the visualization, Shelly is Gemma Chan. I love her so much, okay? So um, everyone's at attention when she walks in. And later we find out it's because she is the wife of Frank. And Frank is the owner of the Victory Project. He is the boss of all of their husbands, and this is his wife. So yeah, they're kind of scared of her. She walks in. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Shelly. In unison. I have some very exciting news. The Victory Project has hired a new employee, Bill Johnson, and I've invited his wife, Violet, to join us today. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Violet Johnson. Welcome, Violet. Now let's begin. Remember, ladies, there is beauty and control. There is grace and symmetry. We move as one. And they all start practicing their moves as teacher Shelley starts walking to criticize their every single step and every single breath. I mean, she really is terrifying. I would myself. And Alice, she doesn't seem to have it that bad. Compared to the other wives, some of them have some wild ass kids running around that like to play out in the yard, turn on their hoses and sprinkle it around. The moms gather at the end of the cul-de-sac to drink margaritas while gossiping before their husbands come home. And Alice, she spends most of her time in her quiet childless home, humming and hanging clothes on the clothesline, making dinner, a juicy steak for her husband. You know, her husband's gotta eat steak, it's a good source of protein. And then um, that day when she gets out the eggs, for some reason she holds them up, she just looks at it, and something compels her to crush it in her hand. And oddly, there is no egg inside, it's just a shell. <laughs> she stops humming. How is that even possible? She grabs another one, crushes it in her hand. It's just an empty egg, just the shell. Another one, another one. She does this with a stunned look on her face. I mean, maybe one, fine. Maybe there's an explanation. Two, maybe it's a bad batch. Three, in one carton? What the hell is going on? She's so focused on the egg that she completely burns the steak. And at that moment, Jack pulls up to the driveway and comes home. Thankfully, Alice is able to salvage the dinner and manages to get into a nice black strapless dress and heels. And when Jack opens the door, she's standing in front of the front door with a glass of whiskey in her hand for him. And she has dinner on the table. What? Yeah. How? Super crazy housewife skills, you know what I mean? And now the eggs. Ooh. Oh yeah. But instead of dinner, I mean, there was no point in even getting the dinner ready on time because instead of dinner, they have some wild, wild sex. I mean, this couple is literally, I guess, the picture perfect couple, depending on how you look at it. Because fuck the steak, you know, fuck the roast. Just fuck each other. Harry Styles and Florence Pugh, I like it, okay? Ooh. So the next day, Alice joins the girls at the pool and she's sitting next to her best friend slash neighbor, Bunny who also happens to be Olivia Wilde, and apparently these two hate each other, so. I don't know, I just kept thinking about that while I was watching the movie, because they're supposed to be best friends, but they freaking hate each other, allegedly. Anyway, Alice is humming her song, the same one that she's been humming the whole movie, and Bunny interrupts her. Okay, you've got to stop singing that song. What song is it even? Like, where did you find this song? 
God, what song is it? It's just a random hum, and she's、oh. like, "God, I know, I don't." Watermelon sugar. Yeah, <laughs> it's been stuck in my head for days. I was hoping you could tell me. Do you know what song this is? Maybe if I just listened to it, it wouldn't be so stuck. No, I don't know. And right next to them, Violet, the new,、um, the new neighbor is there, and she says, "Well, maybe it's like a children's song, something your kids sing." Oh, I don't have children. Oh. But he's like, "Don't get me started. I live next door to them, and you wouldn't believe the things I hear Alex and Jack do. It, it's not that. It's just that we don't want. Like, you know, we're just having fun right now. You know, it's like they're on a perpetual honeymoon or something. Violet, you gotta stay away from their house. Be careful when you touch surfaces. Don't go in their bedroom." And Alice is like, "You know what? But it's, it's just, Bunny's kids like me more than they like her anyway." And Bunny's like, "You know, that's true. It's infuriating." And Violet starts droning on and on about how she thinks three is the perfect number for kids, but Bill wants four kids. Oh my God! Meanwhile, Alice has some sort of flashback or some sort of hallucination. I don't know. It's so brief, but it looks like some sort of burlesque club from the '30s or something. Just keep this in mind. There's dancers. It's in black and white. It's just very interesting. So anyway, later that day, Alice joins Jack to go meet his boss Frank. He's the boss of the whole Victory Project, remember? And that includes the town of Victory. He's like the CEO, cult leader, owner of Victory. It genuinely feels like a cult. They all go meet in his massive mansion that looks like one of those cool LA mansions with those giant pools, surrounded by lush palm trees, the greenest grass that you will ever see. They've got like sleek, modern white house with glass panels. You know those staircases that have no bottom, so you just see air as you're walking up top.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, those give me anxiety, and he has one of those. He even has like a toy model of the whole Victory Town map. This is giving me like cult. I mean, even the mountains in the distance are shown in the freaking、uh, toy model map or whatever, and everything just looks so uniform and so perfect. And Alice can't help but trace her fingers along the road to the exit of Victory. You know, the exit that you're not supposed to go to. And at the party, everyone is, you know, drinking Manhattans and talking and gossiping. Violet and the girls are getting to know each other. Remember, Violet is the new one, right? And she's talking about how she honeymooned in Seattle, and so did Alice and Jack. So great, that's good, common ground. And Alice is like, so do you like it here? Oh,、uh, to be honest, I've been out of it since we've arrived. Bill, my husband, says it's the jet lag, but it's all been such a blur. Yeah, no, don't worry about it. Bunny's like, it's the desert air. You'll get used to it. Meanwhile, Bill, Violet's husband, and the rest of the guys are bonding, and they're talking about how nervous they are to join the project. But they're so happy that they did. But also, Bill mentions that he hasn't talked to Frank much, and he's like, you know, I, I haven't been able to talk to Frank much. And one of the guys interrupts and says. Frank doesn't have to talk to you. You're lucky to even be standing in his house. He's incredible. He's extraordinary. You don't even know. Oh, sorry. I just thought that I would get more time to talk to him, but I'm sorry. I'm just excited. I didn't mean to be offensive or think that I was demanding to talk to him or anything. Alice overhears, and she finds it a tad bit strange. I mean, think about it. This is your boss. Why are they treating him like he's some sort of prophet? But before she can even ask, Shelley, Frank's wife, dings her cocktail glass and starts giving an intro speech. Before Frank walks down his mansion steps, she talks about, you know, what Frank has created out here. It's a different way, a better way. It's truly special, and we only have each other. And right before everyone starts clapping because they see Frank walking down to make a speech of his own, one of the wives, Margaret, speaks up. Why are we here? Her husband pulls at her arm. Come on, honey, let's go. But she's undeterred. We shouldn't be here. And then she's slowly getting dragged away by her husband. And the group doesn't really know how to react to what they just saw. Frank approaches the group, who stare at up at him in confusion and admiration, like he's this cult leader. And he starts his speech. Margaret and Ted are going through a difficult time. Margaret's question is right, though. It's a great one to ask. Why the hell are we here? <laughs> Why, you know, when this landscape can seem so barren, so dusty, so worthless, the desert? Why not run, huh? Why not go back to safety, back to where we should be? No, 
We choose to stand our ground, to dig deeper, to look harder, to mine that pure, unbridled potential, the gem of limitless and unimaginable value. That's why we're here. I would say that it's braver to search for what could be. Dean, what is the enemy of progress? Chaos. Chaos is the enemy of progress, sir. Yes. Yes. Chaos. Nasty word. Chaos. Merciless foe. That chaos. Energy unfocused. Innovation hindered. Greatness disguised. Will I see greatness in each one of you? I know exactly who you are. So what are we doing? And everyone speaks up, including the wives. Changing the world. Changing the world, yes. And Dr. Collins joins us today, if we can all give an applause. Do you want to be a co-leader, honey? I think Am you I want selling to. this part? I think you just, I think you want to. Deep down, you want to be Deep a down, I want to be a co-leader? So, yeah. Honey, I have to just sell a part, you know what I mean? This is actually my audition tape. One day, I'm going to try to make it in Hollywood, and I'm going to show them these videos. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Dr. Collins joins us today, and he is the first, one of the first, that helped me build this community. And uh, thank you, Dr. Collins, for your vision. And our newest addition, Bill. Thank you, Bill, for joining us and choosing to join us on this great adventure, for being our partner in this. And thank you, Violet, for being his partner in this. He could not do this without you. All of you wives, in fact, we men, we ask a lot. We ask for strength, we ask for a shoulder to cry on, food at home, a house cleaned, and discretion above all else. And that, that is very difficult. And he grabs Shelly. Shelly, you are my rock, and I would not be here without you. And they start making out, and the whole making crowd out. goes crazy. They whoop and they cheer, because, like, I don't know, I guess seeing your cult leader make out with his wife is just so hot and steamy. It just feels like all the men want to make out with him instead of, you know, <laughs> it's just kind of bizarre. Why is it the season of wetness? No, but really, it doesn't matter if I'm here in Atlanta or in New York, I just get stuck in the rain. So the idea of sitting there with wet socks, oh. The idea of sitting on the train with wet socks, in the Uber with wet socks, planning out which shoes to wear, like wondering if I'm gonna run into rain or not, I hate that. And I used to do that until I found Vessies. I have been wearing Vessie sneakers for a few years now because first of all, they're so comfortable. It's like a no brainer all around sneaker. I slip them on, I don't even tie them. I have them by the front door. I have pairs here in New York. I wear them to any errands I have to run. I always pack them when I'm traveling because they're so lightweight and it's honestly so cute. They match all my outfits, but the best part is they are 100% waterproof. So you never have to worry about what kind of weather you're gonna be stuck in. I just immediately put them on whenever I run errands, even if it looks sunny outside, because you just never know. And I love that they keep my feet dry and I don't have to stomp around in rain boots all day just because there's a 30% chance of rain later. The sneakers are amazing. They're made of dual climate knit material. It's called Dymatex, and it keeps you cool in summer and warm in cold weather. I wear them all year round and I just love how comfortable they are. I got my parents a bunch of Vessies and they love it. It is like a great gift for yourself and even for others. And it's just perfect for under the tree, I'm telling you, and for your feet. So check out their holiday sale at Vessie.com slash BAM. Get the style and size you want now before they sell out. If you miss the sale, use code BAM for 15% off your entire order. That's Vessie.com slash BAM. And then, uh, you know, the party rages on and when Alice looks back, Jack is no longer behind her. He has disappeared mid-speech. So she goes looking for him. And in the guest house, she finds Margaret and Ted arguing. And Ted, the husband, he tries to keep a happy front. Oh, sorry, Alice. Could you give us a second? She'll be fine. And Margaret's sitting there, staring at, into a daze. I'm not fine. They're hiding us in here. Nothing is fine. <laughs> Honey, that's not true. Sorry, Alice. She just needs to get some sleep. I don't sleep. I have bad dreams. And before Alice can do anything, Ted slams the door shut in Alice's face. 
So she continues on her mission to find Jack, and she finds him in uh, Frank's bedroom. I don't know why. What? And um, yeah, he was like fixing his tie. Maybe Frank told him to put on a new tie or something. And they just start doing it, okay? They start getting hot and steamy. These two, they cannot keep their hands off of each other. I don't know what it is the whole movie. And while they're doing it, Frank walks in on them, and Jack doesn't see. But Alice does. And instead of stopping, she maintains eye contact with Jack's boss and continues doing it. <laughs> and you know, even reaches a peak right then and there if you catch my drift. So this town is definitely not a normal place. Frank is definitely not a normal boss. The next day, Bunny, Alice, and their other friend Peg, who's always pregnant for some reason, <laughs> they decide to go shopping, which consists of them, you know, sitting on chairs in the mall and models show off clothes. So it's like the future, okay? These models come in and close, and then if you like it, you can just say, I'll take that one. And there's people standing, like the sales associates standing, writing down, and they can charge whatever they want. That's the joy of being part of the Victory Project. What do you mean, they, can, they have unlimited spending power? For clothes and mm -hmm. groceries. And they're gossiping, talking about the outburst that Margaret had at the party chocolate, that night. Chocolate. And Peggy is like, you know, she's gonna get Ted fired. Listen, I'm telling you, if my husband gets fired, I will kill myself. I'm serious. I can't live anywhere else. I mean, I love it here. Alice is trying to be the voice of reason. Look, Margaret's just having a really hard time. And Bunny interjects. And whose fault is that? I know, but I still feel bad for her. It was a terrible accident, I'm sure. Bunny's like, it wasn't an accident. Bunny, come on, stop it. And Peggy says, well, I, I don't want to be rude. I know that Margaret was your friend. And Bunny's mad. She's getting heated. She was our friend when she was normal. And then she lost her mind. She took her son out into the desert. She thought she saw something. She hallucinated. That's what happened. Well, it's not clear what happened, Bunny. Okay. Okay, sorry, that was so distracting, but now we just gotta pop it in the oven for an hour so we can get into the story. Um, they're arguing, the three women are arguing, and Bunny is saying, no, Margaret hallucinated. And Alice is saying, well, it's not exactly clear as to what happened, so we shouldn't be talking like this. But Bunny's upset. She knew how dangerous it was, like we all do. The one thing that they ask of us is to stay here, where it's safe. But still, she dragged her little boy into the middle of God knows what. They don't want us going out there, and they have their reasons. Peggy's like, well, so what happened? She was alone. They never found her son again. I didn't realize that he died. She claims that they took him to punish her. And right then and there, the whole ground shakes. Another earthquake of sorts. Everyone stops, but proceeds as normal. I mean, it's clear that they're already used to this. Bunny says, boys and their toys. At least we know that they're working, right? Well, what do you think they're really doing out there? I mean, I know what they say, development of progressive materials. But sometimes Peter insinuates that they're actually making weapons, and it's all happening underground. And Bunny interrupts her to look all over at the CCTV cameras. Look. We're all here because we believe in the mission. <clears throat> they all nod yes. We all have jobs that are just as important, just as vital. What we do at home, supporting them, taking care of them, without that, they couldn't be here. They couldn't be out there, changing the world. Peggy and Alice nod in agreement, but Alice has a flashback, or a vision, or a nightmare, I don't know. It's women in masks, dancing creepily, trying to reach out at her. And then the days blur. Every morning starts with the same, sending her husband off to work after feeding him bacon and eggs and toast, and then playing Frank's motivational talk of the day. It's a straight up cult. Every single morning, all of them listen to Frank's motivational talks. Alice cleans, cooks, hums her song, and listens to Frank's voice. And most of the time, she has this nice smile plastered on her face. But there will be moments throughout the day where she stops mid-task like mid-vacuuming, with the vacuum on, or the water running as she's doing dishes, and she just zones out, you know? What does that mean? Is she unhappy? I guess we'll find out. Anyway, she's losing her mind cleaning all day, so she puts on another fancy dress, brings her purse, and goes on the little trolley train that goes through the town. That is the main mode of transportation. It's a cute little trolley. This whole place is like a dream. She's just out there for the joy ride, looping around the town, and near the end, she looks out the window, and this is like the edge of town. So you see the desert, and you see the mountains. This is literally the edge. And he's like, well, I gotta turn back around, you know? 
head back into town. And she looks out the window and she sees a plane. And the plane looks like it's losing control, a small red plane. And she moves to the other side of the completely empty trolley. It's just her and the driver. And she moves to the other side to watch the plane and it crashes into the distant mountains. What? Oh my God, stop the train. What's going on, miss? Did you see that? Did you see that? The plane just crashed. We have to go over there. We have to help. We have to help them. I'm sorry, miss, but that's not my route. I don't go over there. What? What if they need our help? We have to go over there. I can't, miss. It's not my route. I can't go out there alone. They need our help. I'm sorry, miss, but it is not my route. Alice looks confused and angry. She grabs her purse and walks out of the train. My God, what is wrong with you? And she starts running towards the mountains by herself. But of course, it is so much further than it looks. And she has to pass by multiple warning signs that say, warning, exiting town limits now. And she freaking knows that she's not allowed to exit this town, okay? And all of it, it's taken a toll on Alice. She's humming, drenched in sweat. Her hair is sticking to her face. Her shoes are caked in dirt. She's just trying to find the plane that crashed. Her breath is ragged. She's getting lost. It's hot. It's a desert. She's climbing up the mountain until she finally reaches this futuristic building. Futuristic building? It looks straight out of Star Wars. It's like a dome. Oh. You know that Nicole Kidman cult show that we watched when we were sick? Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's kind of like that dome. Do you remember the dome building yeah. with the glasses? Uh-huh. And she's like, hello, anyone here? I need help. There's been an accident. A plane went down. Hello? And she, when she reaches the top of the mountain to the dome-shaped building. Hello? Anyone here? She can't even peek inside the building as all the windows are all mirrored. She walks closer and touches the mirrored walls with both hands to see if she can take a peek inside. And she immediately feels something because the minute she touches both her hands, she faints and she starts hearing Frank's voice. One of his speeches, his motivational talks. We can let go of what society has taught us to feel. We can let go of the chaos. We can fall deeper into what we know is true. And then the voice starts getting distorted and Alice has these visions, flashbacks. Honestly, they look more like hallucinations, but soon she wakes up gasping for air, back in her bed, in her house, with the curtains drawn. She wakes up and hears this thumping noise coming from the living room. And she walks out, rubbing her eyes, confused. She, it feels like she's been through some shit, okay? And it's Jack, trying to cook dinner, making a mess. The kitchen's a mess, music is blasting, Jack is a mess. Jack? Oh, you're awake. What's going on? I'm making you dinner. Now, we're supposed to have five courses, but I think, unfortunately, we're down to three. Yeah. And don't, don't look over there. That pan, that course is officially off the menu. Don't even look at it. And Alice is confused. What happened? I just, I got a little bit aggressive with the seasoning. Just don't worry about it. How long have you been home? A few hours? And the whole time Jack is just cooking away, burning himself, seasoning things. Meanwhile, Alice is confused. I mean, is she having hallucinations? She woke up in bed, but she remembers being out in the desert. Like she's freaking out, like she's out of it. And he's acting like it's a normal Tuesday. How the hell did she even get home? I was home when you got home, Jack. Yeah, you were asleep in the bedroom. How did I get home? Trolley, I think. So he came out and got me? The trolley driver? What are you talking about? Jack, I got off the trolley. I saw a plane crash. Alice, I think I would have heard if there was a plane crash. They tend to be rather loud and hard to miss, you know? No, Jack, I saw it. I saw it and I started walking and... And Alice stops because the rest of her memory is gone. And I also think that she doesn't want to tell him that she left the city limits. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't know what to say. She doesn't even know how to explain what she saw. She started walking and then what? She touched a building and then ended up back home. Wait, does she still remember that though? Yeah, she remembers touching the building, but really nothing else after that. Okay. And she just looks very disgruntled. And even in her head, she's thinking, well, maybe it's a dream because how did I get home? It doesn't make sense. If I had fainted out at that building, someone in that building must have known. And they would have told Jack, like it would have been a whole thing. And so Jack is like, what's wrong? Are you okay? I'm not. I guess I just had a really weird dream. A really weird dream. I'm sorry. Do you know what weird dreams make me? What? Hungry. 
and the two hug and munch on carrots. And Alice tries to help Jack in the kitchen, but he refuses, so she goes over to the bar instead and whips up some drinks for them. Hey, Alice, you love me, right? She looks at him and she says, the most. Jack seems happy, but there is something that changed in Alice after that moment. I mean, she still runs through her routine every single day, cleaning the glass, humming, listening to Frank's sermon slash cult talks, but she starts feeling suffocated, literally suffocated. She will be cleaning the window and she will feel the wall pressing up against her. And it's not just an emotional feeling. She will literally, you can see the wall pressing up against her and her face is being smushed up against the glass and almost like cracking her jaw and she's screaming and moaning of like let me go but then she'll step back and realize it was just in her thoughts but it feels so real how could it be just in her thoughts her face was pressed up against the glass she starts panicking that maybe something's very wrong with her and before she can do anything the phone rings she's like oh, get it together hello it's margaret you went out there you saw it margaret you saw it they're all lying to us all of us I can't talk to you right now, Margaret. No one asks any questions here. We can't stay here anymore, Alice. I'm not crazy. You're being ridiculous, Margaret, and you need to stop this. And Margaret starts crying. Please, Alice, you know me. But Alice slams the phone shut and goes to her ballet class. She's going through the motions, but you can tell that there is a part of her that's breaking away from this perfect town and her perfect relationship. Not necessarily, nothing bad happened with Jack, but something is going on in this town. She knows it, and she can't just act like nothing's happening. She can't just act happy when something sinister is going on. And from there, Alice starts hallucinating. Even during ballet class, she starts seeing herself in the reflection, but her reflection morphs into Margaret, who keeps smashing her head against the mirror. And when she screams, the whole ballet class stops in confusion to stare at Alice. And she points at the mirror, but when she looks back, it's just their reflection. Margaret's not even in the class. So she screams, maybe she's terrified, she's the next Margaret, she's gonna lose her mind just like her, right? Or more likely she thinks it's a premonition that something very bad is going to happen to Margaret. Alice runs all the way home to find Margaret who is also her neighbor and she is standing on the roof of her own home with a knife next what? to her throat. And Alice is like, Margaret, no! And she slits her throat before flinging herself off the roof. Alice just witnessed her former friend commit and all she could do was watch. She tries to run up to Margaret's lifeless body to save her, to help her, to do something. But before she gets there, men in red jumpsuits hold her back and drag her back into the house. And she's screaming, let me go, Margaret, Margaret, let me go. And that night, her perfect relationship facade disintegrates completely. I mean, you would imagine, right? You would just think, okay? You would imagine after Alice witnesses her friend slash neighbor committing she's gonna get some emotional help from Jack, some sort of mental help. But nope, he just wants to go to sleep. And she's still screaming at him. I saw her, I saw what she did, and they just dragged me away. Why would they take me away? Alice, you have to stop. There's no way that she's fine, Jack, there's no way. Alice, I don't know what to tell you. Ted is at the hospital with her right now. He said that she needs a few stitches. She slipped while cleaning the window. It was an accident. No! <laughs> I saw her. She cut herself. You had a bad night. You saw her fall and you imagined the worst case scenario. Nope. <laughs> no. Don't do that. She slit her throat and I saw it. Don't do that. I saw what I saw. That's crazy, Alice. This whole thing is crazy. Jack, I saw it happen. She cut her throat. There was blood everywhere. It wasn't just a few stitches. Please, don't get hysterical, Alice, please. Jack, she was my friend and she came to me for help and then I ignored her and then this happened and I feel like it was my fault. It's no one's fault, Alice. It was an accident. Oh my God. No, she said they would come after her because she knew something. Why are they lying about what's going on? What are they hiding here? Alice, please just stop. She was cleaning windows. She's fine. She needed a few stitches. 
Come on, Jack. You have to admit it's weird. There's something off. Stop, Alice. There is nothing wrong. What are you doing at the Victory Project, Jack? You know what I do, Alice. I'm a technical engineer. I know, but what are they doing? Please, what's actually happening here? Don't ask me that, Alice. What? The development of progressive materials? What does that even mean? You know I can't talk about this. What does that even mean? Please, do you know what Frank is even doing? Do you even know? It's classified. We're not even allowed to discuss our jobs with different departments. You know that. What if Margaret was right? And Jack starts losing his patience and he screams, Just stop it! Stop it, Alice! What if this place is dangerous? And he screams at her, Stop it! I am part of something important, Alice. This mission, what Frank is doing, it matters. Not everyone gets this opportunity. And if you keep talking like this, you're going to put it all at risk. Put what at risk? Oh my god. Are you worried about a demotion right now? Are you worried about that? No! Our life, our life together. This, we could lose this. So please, just get a hold of yourself. And he walks off. No comfort, no love, after everything she just witnessed, nothing. And she's being gaslit into thinking she didn't just witness what she just freaking witnessed, and that's pretty freaking horrible. So that night, she can't sleep. She sits in front of the TV, which is black and white only, and it's a TV straight out of the 50s, and terrifyingly, it's just all propaganda in there for the town of victory. How the town of victory is fantastic. You can finally live the life you deserve. Listen, don't ever trust a town that needs that much advertisement begging you to live there. It's weird. Something is definitely going on. But the days go on as normal. The next day, Alice must make breakfast, then lunch, and send Jack off to work. But as she saran wrapping some leftovers, she calmly, so calmly, so eerily, while humming, starts wrapping the saran wrap around her face. Multiple layers. What? Till she can't breathe. And then she starts touching the saran wrap to cover all the holes. And then you see her trying to breathe in and out, and her face is all smushed. And she's kind of enjoying it, and then all of a sudden she starts panicking, and she starts trying to find the edge of the saran wrap to rip it off to unravel it, but she can't, so she's trying to poke holes. And then finally, she pokes a hole in the saran wrap and rips it off. And after that, Dr. Collins is asked to pay a visit to Alice and Jack's place that day. And, uh, you know, Jack is very concerned. Is Alice okay, Doctor? Is there some sort of new bug going around? Um, not that I know of. This looks like just run-of-the-mill exhaustion. Do you have any new stresses or pressures lately, Alice? Um, Dr. Collins, she saw Ted's wife fall. I thought maybe it was the shock. Yeah, yeah, well that was quite a tumble. She was so embarrassed. It wasn't a tumble. She slit her throat. Alice, please. Dr. Collins seems to be a bit more sympathetic, at least initially. He smiles and smiles at Jack. Witnessing a trauma can often lead to distorted memories, even nightmares. It's, it's, I have some pills I can prescribe for that. Oh, I really don't think I need those. Oh, they're just precautionary. Most patients have had a lot of success with them. And he opens up his suitcase to write the prescription, but she sees inside a file, a bright blue file that says Margaret, and next to her name, security risk. Why would a doctor label a patient as a security risk? Security risk of what? And now Alice feels justified. She's being freaking gaslit. She's even more confident in what she saw now. You know, what's wrong with these people? What's wrong with her husband? Does he know? Or is he being gaslit too? To think that Margaret just fell and his wife is being hysterical. The pills will just keep you relaxed. It'll be fine. And Alice is looking at Jack for help. And finally he steps in like the husband should. Dr. Collins, I don't think that she needs those. This isn't a problem. We can handle it ourselves. Okay. Well then, I'll just keep these on file, just in case. Finally, Jack, stepping up. But before the doctor can leave, Alice asks, What did you do to Margaret? Pardon? Ted's wife, how did you treat her? And Dr. Collins looks at Jack with a mean look, and then smiles back at Alice. Um, it's almost like a you better have her cut the shit out right now type of look. I'm sorry, I'm just, I still don't understand how she's okay. Dr. Collins leans forward. You wouldn't want me to discuss the details of your treatment with other patients, now would you? Hmm, I wouldn't mind. I would just really love to know the details of how you fixed her. 
Well, as you know, we both provide psychiatric and physical care here, and Margaret was in need of both. The good news is she was physically fine, but not psychologically. She was having significant troubles. Outbursts, paranoia, she made it impossible for Ted to do her job. So he no longer works for the Victory Project. She just needed quite a bit of help, but not like you. And Jack says, no, not like her. It's not necessary here. It's a totally different scenario. Everyone smiles and it's super tense and the Dr. Collins says, yeah, you know what the Brits say, cause Jack is British, Harry Styles is British. Keep calm and carry on. Anyway, Jack, walk me out. And they all smile and say their thanks and goodbyes. And he turns around before leaving. And remember, Alice, I'm only a phone call away. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor, thank you. And Jack walks Dr. Collins to the door, but he had left his briefcase. And you better believe Alice is trying to rip that thing open and trying to get Margaret's file out of there. And just in time, she hides it behind a cushion and Dr. Collins walks back in. She hands him the briefcase. So glad you came back for this. You almost forgot. Oh, thank you, Alice. I would be forgetting my head if it wasn't screwed on. Thank you. And Jack, shouldn't you be heading back to work? And the two grab their briefcases and walk out. Meanwhile, Alice runs over to Margaret's file that she had just stolen and that she thought, you know, she was going to read it and put it back, but nope. I thought she was just going to read it and put it back, but nope, she stole it, okay? And she kept it. Not that it did her any good. Oddly, everything in there was redacted from the file. Literally, everything was blacked out in black boxes except for the already known information such as Margaret's name, a picture of Margaret. Everything else was blacked out. I mean, why? Alice had to burn the file in her fireplace to make sure that she was never caught with it, but it's not like she got anything out of it to begin with. And it really starts like the beginning of the end for Alice. I have 5 million people in this house all the freaking time. I swear I do. Sometimes I'll be coming downstairs and I'm like, wait, what the heck, Dan Dan? Where did you get here? I actually think he's here right now. And I don't even know when people are coming over. And it's like ingrained in their heads. Whenever you come to this house, you don't come full. You gotta be hungry. And they all want a fresh home cooked meal. So we need a lot of delicious food to make sure people don't start throwing fits at our house. And Green Chef is one of my favorite ways to do that. You guys know that I love HelloFresh and Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh. I know people like my sister who love switching between the brands, but I personally do both at the same time because we have so many mouths to feed. Green Chef makes eating so easy with plans to fit every lifestyle. So it doesn't matter who our guests are. We have keto plans, paleo dishes, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or if you're just someone that's looking for delicious balanced meals, Green Chef has something for everyone. They have 30 recipes to choose from weekly. You can always mix and match meals in the same box, order vegan one day, do keto the next. I love it. On top of that, they have these new curated collection of premium dinners, which I've just been loving for the holidays because you feel extra special. You can celebrate all the holidays with a variety of easy to follow recipes, premium proteins, organic produce. You can even swap protein for like USDA certified organic ground beef or chicken, wild caught sockeye salmon. Fantastic. But on the flip side, Green Chef also has 10 minute lunches that is no cooking required, which is amazing for my sister and Andrew because they take lunch to work and it's so good. They've got quick lunches, breakfast, and more. And recipes are so easy to make. They come with pre-made measured sauces and spices to make everything so much easier. Our family will come over and just cook food for themselves, but for some reason, nobody does the dishes. And Green Chef is the only meal kit that is both carbon and plastic offset, so you can feel good about your food. So make sure to go to greenchef.com slash baking599 and use code baking599 to get $5.99 per meal on your first box and your first box ships free. That's greenchef.com slash baking599 and use code baking599 to get $5.99 per meal on your first box and your first box ships free. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. She looks somber as she goes to run a very hot bath for herself. She's drinking whiskey, downing glass after glass, and she's having hallucinations and visions, and she remembers vaguely a hallucination of her and Jack in bed, or her with someone in bed? Was it Jack? We don't really know. And she wakes up from the bathtub and Jack is home getting ready. And Alice looks fucking confused because where did the time go? And apparently there's another party that night at Frank's house and even picked out a dress for her. I just couldn't stop picturing you in it. It's beautiful, isn't it? Thank you, Jack. Yeah, you'll look incredible. And you know what? I've been thinking something crazy, okay? Let's have a baby. What? I mean, not right now. <laughs> 
but soon. Look, I love you, and I want more of you, and I think I want a little you running around. Jack is giggling, he's happy, but she's smiling and thinking, what the f***, dude? Um, okay. Uh, I don't know, I just think it'll be fun. Just think about it, okay, Alice? Anyway, tonight's gonna be great. You're gonna look f***ing beautiful. Alice looks like she's about to throw up, okay? It's, this is not the party that she was looking for. This is the second to last thing that she wants to do is this f***ing party. The first thing that she doesn't want to do is have a freaking baby, okay? Anyway, she slips down into the bath one more time before getting out, and you see that her reflection in the mirror doesn't follow her down. It's weird. And the party is a big blast. It feels very much Great Gatsby style, very lavish, like 20s black tie party. There's a whole stage and a band and orchestra. There's this giant uh, glass martini and dancers will go up in there and dance and stuff. It's crazy. Alice joins the friends, but she's definitely not feeling it. Like there's definitely a difference between the first party that they went to in Frank's backyard to this nighttime party. The first party, Alice was all about it. She's all about victory. She loves this place. And now, now she's confused. Shelly even comes over to ask how she's feeling. Great, wonderful, much better now. Thank you for inviting us. It's beautiful here. Shelly smiles, walks her way over to the stage for another uplifting speech about her own husband, about how great he is, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, Alice catches Frank staring at her from across the party. And it's very unsettling. But also, are they gonna f***? Listen, you just never know, okay? Shelly goes onto the stage to announce that she has prepared a gift for everyone, including Frank. And it is a beautiful performer, completely covered in sequins, in a shimmering dress, dancing, singing, in a giant sparkly martini glass, big enough to fit multiple people like a bathtub. And while everyone is screaming in joy and having a blast, Alice can't stop having flashbacks to Margaret's side. And she starts crying. Tears are pooling in her eyes, and she's about to have a full-blown panic attack. And just as the show finishes, Frank is making his rounds screaming, everyone get up! This is what I'm talking about. You work hard, you play hard. Jack's having a blast, but Alice grabs his arm. Please, Jack, I want to go home. But he can't really, because Frank goes on stage to give a speech, and now's really not the best time to go home. She's begging him that they need to leave right now, please. But he's telling her that she's going to be okay, she just needs to drink. Please, please, I just need to go home. But Jack's already checked out. Frank is on stage, and Jack cares more about what Frank is doing than his own wife. That's going to be hard to beat, but I have to admit, everyone, I was planning a little presentation of my own. Jack Chambers. If I could have you up here for a moment. The energy shifts. Is it good? Is it bad? We don't know. Even Frank doesn't look happy. And before he goes up on the stage, Alice is begging him to go home. She needs to go home. She's like, I need to go home. We need to leave. I need to go home. But he just puts his finger on her lip, which others would see as this lovingly gesture. But in reality, it's just shutting her up. Jack makes his way onto the stage. Tonight is my favorite night of the year. I love seeing everybody under one roof, seeing how much we've all grown. But few, few have grown as impressively as this young man right here. Okay, so it's good. I've debated long and hard about this, Lord knows, and it's certainly out of the ordinary. But you know what? This man, Jack Chambers, is out of the ordinary. This man I am in awe of. Jack Chambers, I am honored to invite you to join our senior advisory board in the Victory Project. And the whole room bursts into applause and Alice looks up with tears in her eyes waiting for Jack's response and Frank presents him with a ring. A ring to symbolize that he's a senior executive at the Victory Project. And he whispers to Jack in front of the whole stage. But I don't know if people can hear it. Are you the man that you say you are? And Jack Chambers nods. And he puts the ring on his finger. Thank you for your loyalty. All good things to come. Jack looks incredibly pleased, but Frank notices Alice looking stressed and emotional, looking miserable. Jack stays on stage dancing and singing with Frank, but Alice rushes to the bathroom. She's nowhere to be seen in the crowd. She's having a full-blown panic attack at this point, staring at herself in the mirror. Bunny finds her in the bathroom, her best friend. Mm -hmm. Only one that noticed, not even her own husband noticed. And, you know, she even jumps in fear when Bunny tries to reach out for her. Alice, sweetie, what's wrong? Hey, honey, what happened? Everything's gonna be fine, it's okay. Bunny, we need to get out of here. We need to get out of here right now. We need to go. No, 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 
no, it's okay. We're okay. We need to go. It's okay. Tell me. Come on. Tell me what happened. It's okay. Margaret was right. She was asking questions, and they don't want us to ask questions, so they silenced her. She didn't slip. It wasn't an accident. I saw it. I saw her fall. They're lying about everything. Bunny went from being genuinely worried for her friend to looking a bit worried, but also very pissed off. I went out there, and I saw it. You went out where? And when I touched it, I saw something, and I keep remembering more, and I remember Frank's voice, and he's in my head. Meanwhile, Bunny is backing away from Alice, and she looks terrified of her, and even grossed out. Can I just show you? We can just go out there right now. Everyone's going to be distracted. We can just take Dean's car. Stop. Stop it. Have you lost your mind? What? You went out to headquarters? Because I thought I saw a plane crash. It's the one rule that they ask us to respect. I know, but you know how dangerous that is? You stole from Dr. Collins? Get a hold of yourself, Alice. You're behaving like a child. Your husband is out there having the most important night of his life. He's being celebrated. And you are in here trying to ruin it? No. You sound exactly like Margaret. And Bunny looks pissed and displeased and disappointed. And she runs out of the bathroom. Meanwhile, Frank is out there with Jack on the stage screaming, Whose world is this? And the whole crowd screams, Ours! <laughs> Whose world is this? Ours! And the next day, Alice isn't just hungover. She's completely checked out of her life. She's making breakfast for Jack. He's talking about his promotion. And she's got to get it together. She has to host a promotion dinner for Jack and his buddies, as well as Frank, tonight. And it was honestly her idea, okay? What? I think the talk with Bunny snapped her out of it. I think she needs to be, you know, excited for her husband and do all these wifely duties. So the friends arrive first. Peggy and her husband, you know, the one that's always pregnant. Mm -hmm. Violet and her husband, the new addition. And Bunny will not be attending. Mm -hmm. And they're whispering about how Frank and Shelly are coming, which is insane because they never go to people's houses. One of the guys wants to know, hey, Jack, I mean, how the fuck did you get Frank to come to your house? It wasn't me, it was Alice. Wow, I get it. These are the perks. It's this life you're living now, huh? And they all giggle. And in walks Frank and Shelly. Wow, Jack, you crazy son of a bitch. Here, put this bottle on ice. What a lovely home you have. Thanks for coming, Frank. The other guys are trying to suck up to Frank, but it's not working. He just seems to really like Jack. Even Shelly favors Jack, which, you know, they're drinking glasses with them. Meanwhile, Alice seems to be doing a lot better. She's entertaining, she's hosting, finishing up dinner, making sure nobody helps her, and everyone sits in the living room waiting for dinner to be served. Meanwhile, Alice is in there humming slicing up some, you know, veggies, and Frank sneaks in on her. I learned something very exciting, Alice. Oh yeah? What's that, Frank? Rumor is that you and Jack are trying. Oh, well, we'll see. Hope we'll see a little boy. And they both laugh. I'm sorry Bunny didn't believe you. And Alice stops cutting her fruit. And Frank laughs. But then again, you didn't believe Margaret, so why would anyone believe you? <laughs> and he laughs again. My God, Alice, you fascinate me. Because I've been waiting for someone like you. Someone to challenge me. No great man has ever changed history without being pushed to the limits of his potential. And you push me. And I do hope you keep going. And he walks up behind her, a little too close, a little too intimate. And yet, here you are. Preparing dinner. Like a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughs again before walking off. Soon they all sit down for dinner, Frank at the end of one table and Alice on the other end, and the rest are sitting on the sides. Peggy and Shelly are talking about Peggy's pregnancy and how Peggy wants another boy. You know, they're hoping for a boy because they have boys and girls, and girls are just so hard, you know? The boy favoritism is real. And they all start talking about complete nonsense, things that don't really matter. They're all in a good mood. Before Alice breaks the chatter with, Violet, where are you from? Pardon? I said, where are you from? Philadelphia. And Peggy looks shocked and excited. I'm from Philadelphia! Oh, are you serious? I didn't know that. And they're bonding about being from Philly, but Alice interrupts again. Most of the women here are from Philadelphia. Or Baltimore. Or Chicago. Frank looks to be enjoying the challenge. He's smiling. Peggy, shh, just right over her head. Oh, I haven't noticed 
that before. But I, for one, I do not miss the winters in Philly. No, no, no. I thrive on the sunshine. Even though my alabaster skin is so pale, I love it. Oh, yes. I love the sunshine, too. I love the beach. What was the last beach you guys went to? And Peggy's husband starts talking. Fun fact about the beach. Beaches are actually some of the filthiest places in the whole world. Just a sandbox of disease. Peter, do not say disease at the dinner table. It's true. They need to know. I can probably guess the last beach that everyone went to. Hilton Head, Cape Cod, or the Jersey Shore. And we all honeymooned in Sea Island or the Poconos or Niagara Falls. And Violet's husband just says, I think they're just popular honeymoon destinations, you know? What's not to love? Peg's like, yeah, that's true. Beautiful places. Sorry, I'm not quite finished. Violet, where did you meet Bill? Well, we met on a train. And Alice finishes the conversation for her. To Boston. Yeah. You dropped your ticket, he bent down, picked it up, gave it to you, right? Right. It's... That's how Margaret met Ted. And Peggy, am I right to believe that's also how Debbie McIntyre met her husband? Yeah, I am right. That's how they met. What? Yeah, it's true. I'm so jealous. It's such a cute story. Isn't it funny, all these coincidences? Frank smiles and says, incredible. Yeah, there are only so many stories that we're told. Because we're told what to remember. Until we try to remember things that they don't want us to. Like Margaret. Jack tries to stop Alice, but Frank stops him. No, Jack, it's okay. I'm curious to hear where she's going with this. And this is when Alice starts losing it. She says, Frank is doing something to us. And everyone at the table gets quiet, glancing at Frank. And Frank smiles and calmly says, Delusions, memory problems, hysteria. We all saw these problems with Margaret. And you know that it's completely curable. Dr. Collins prescribed you a suite of medications, which you are clearly not taking. And the question is, why? He's lying to us. He's lying to all of us. And everyone at the table, they glance around. Even Bunny, your best friend, is worried about you, Alice. She thinks that you need help. Is that why she's not here tonight? Because you didn't want to be reminded of what's going on with you. Look, don't listen to Frank. He's using you. He's using all of us. Do you guys even know what the Victory Project actually is? Have you ever asked? Do you? Is that why you went out there? To headquarters. And the whole table freezes and Jack looks so betrayed. You wandered out by yourself. You ignored every rule and put all of our lives in danger. I went out to headquarters and I saw what he was hiding. I saw it. He's lying to all of us about what the big victory project actually is. He's lying and I saw it. He's trapped us here. Trapped. I hope nobody feels trapped. Do you guys feel trapped? Nobody agrees with Alice. Alice, nobody feels trapped. This is your psychosis. You're experiencing trust as a feeling of entrapment, yet you trust every day. We all do. Tonight, you've trusted us in your home, just like I've trusted you in my bedroom. What? And the whole table looks shocked. I mean, what does this even mean? Is he talking about the fact that he, that she had sex with Jack in his bedroom? Or that they had sex? We don't know, but what's crazy is that her husband, Jack, looks confused but he won't do anything about it. Like that implies almost that he slept with her. You would think that most husbands would be ready to throw some punches if they just were announced that their wife slept with someone, no? Mm -hmm. Not the wife, but maybe at the dude, but he's just like accepted it. If Frank sleeps with his wife, it seems like Frank slept with his wife. <laughs> so Alice completely ignores it. He, he's trying to create a world. If you want to articulate your own argument, try using your own words, Alice. He's using all of us, all of us. What's in the food then? Where does the food come from, huh? I'm so sorry, everyone, I'm sorry. And he starts apologizing to Bill and uh, Violet, the newest additions to Victory. Just think about it. The, the food is from Victory Mill, Victory Meat, Victory Eggs. It all comes from him, from Victory. And she's ranting, but Frank is apologizing to the couple. I'm sorry, this usually doesn't happen. She's very sick and she'll get the help that she needs. And in the back, Alice keeps going, everything we're told, everything we're given, it comes from him. It's all about control. We wouldn't even know he could be poisoning the food right now. And now Shelly steps in. I love her, Gemma Chan. Enough. We come to your house. 
We sit at your table and you insult and degrade my husband. He invites you to be part of something as extraordinary as he is. And you sit there like a spoiled brat demanding answers to questions you've made up. There's a pattern, isn't there? A pattern of selfish, pampered whining. Or is it just desperation to be exciting? Spitting in the face of this opportunity, it's heartbreaking that your sad, desperate paranoia could destroy what we are trying to build. Well, I won't listen to your pathetic ranting any longer. Frank, honey, I'll be in the car. And she calmly gets up and leaves. And so does everyone else. Nobody bothers to even say goodbye to Alice. They pretty much all hate her now. Potentially even her own husband, Jack. Everyone jumps up and leaves, and leaves just Frank and Alice at the table. The husband left her? And before he leaves, he says, I was expecting so much more from you, Alice. Good luck. And with that, he gets up. Jack comes back into the house after talking with Frank, grabs his whiskey glass, goes to the living room, and sits down quietly. Did you enjoy yourself tonight, Alice? What? No, I didn't enjoy myself tonight. You planned a whole evening to sabotage me. No, I, I would never do that to you. I would never do that to you. I love you. I'm trying to save us. You're trying to save us by going out there. Yes, because I saw a plane crash. I told you. But Jack, everything I told you at that table is true. Frank even admitted to me. He admitted to me in the kitchen. That's why I did that. That's why all of this happened. He wouldn't have done that, Alice. Alice looks like she's about to lose her shit. Jack, please. Everyone is acting like I'm crazy, and I'm not crazy. And I need you to listen to me. I need you to look at me. Okay, please, look at me, please. To me, you are bigger than all of this. You're bigger than victory. You're bigger than Frank, and I believe in you. I believe in you. I don't believe in him. I don't trust him. I don't trust this place, and I don't want to be here anymore. Please, we need to leave. I don't want to be here anymore. We need to leave. We can go anywhere and we can create our own world and it'll just be you and me and we'll be okay. It's not even about where we go. It's just that we're together. Jack's not responding and she's begging and he just kisses her hand. Okay. 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 Now Alice feels so relieved in the two share a kiss and she's sobbing in his arms. I love you. I love you but we need to leave tonight. We need to go. We can't be here. She looks really happy, but Jack looks devastated. He looks torn. He doesn't know what to do. She packs up everything in the house, even packs a snack because they might be driving all night. She jumps in the car and he's in the driver's seat. Go, let's go. I packed us a snack just in case, but we got to get out of here. But Jack doesn't move. Babe, what's wrong? I tried so hard to keep this from happening. I love you so much, Alice. And I'm so sorry. What? We need to go, Jack. And she looks up to see men in red coming to grab her from the car. And she's screaming, no, please, Jack, no, blah, blah, blah. And he's screaming, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And she's sobbing, begging Jack and the men in red. She keeps telling them that she can do better. She can be better. Please, just don't do this. And he refuses to help her. He just keeps crying, I'm so sorry, while she gets dragged out of the car. She's screaming that they're hurting her, and he won't even do anything. He's just screaming in frustration and hitting his steering wheel. Great man, great man. And we see Alice gets strapped onto the operating table and she's still begging them to stop, but they refuse. They put a clamp in her mouth and they start performing electroshock therapy on her in hopes of fixing her. But instead of fixing her, it gives her memories of what they used to be before victory. Her and Jack, they were in love. And now, now look at him. He'll do anything for Project Victory. They're laying in bed, worried. At one point, Jack was wondering how he'll even take care of Alice. She offers to pick up some extra shifts before he gets another job. You know, it's no problem. And by the time that they're done electrocuting her, zapping her, she remembers everything. She remembers that she used to be a resident doctor, a surgeon in training. She was super successful. Everyone respected her. She was going to do great things. She would come home super tired and Jack would be on his computer. And the minute that she walks in the door, he's kind of whining. You're so late. I thought you were going to be home by 10. Yeah, so did I. Surgery ran really long. Well, I'm starving. I haven't eaten. Why not? I wasn't sure what you wanted, and you never texted me back. What? I mean, the dude just doesn't want to cook, let's be real. <sighs> he's like literally a bitch baby. You can feed yourself. It's not that big of a deal. 
I don't have my phone in the OR, Jack. Would it be nice to know that? <laughs> what? And their relationship is tense. They both go into the kitchen. Alice goes to wash her hands. By the way, their apartment before victory wasn't great. Not great at all. In fact, pretty sh**. They both look less put together. Their apartment isn't this fancy mid-modern century house anymore. Jack was never dressing in suits. He had a ton of unkept facial hair. He looked like he hadn't showered in days. Is the hot water still not working? I called the guy today. He said he couldn't come. <sighs> she looks annoyed. Because are you serious, dude? You were home all day. I'm sure you could have manage to fix it or do something about it. It's not like you have kids to watch. She's over it. She can't take a hot shower tonight. She just wants to go to bed so that she can be ready for work tomorrow. More surgeries. But Jack, Jack wants to have sex. Come on, I haven't seen you all day. I know, I know babe, but I'm just really tired. And he keeps trying to get her to have sex. And finally, she loses it. Jack, just stop! I just finished a 30 hour shift. I sewed up 12 people. I gotta be back in six hours and I'm so fucking tired, okay? I just need to go to bed. And she runs into the bedroom and slams the door shut. And he looks very upset. He goes back to his computer and stays up all night listening to a guy, Frank. Welcome to my morning routine. I'm going to break it down for you. The first thing that I do when I open my eyelids, I grab my phone and I immediately check my credit score without failing every single morning. Do you agree? Okay, you're like, no, she never does that. And if it sounds weird, it's because it is. I never do that. Maybe I should, but who actually does? At Chime, that's exactly what they do. With their secure Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can start to build your credit with your own money. How it works is Chime will report your payments to credit bureaus to help you build credit over time, and Chime members see an increase of 30 points on average, which I think is insane. And all of this with no annual fees, large security deposits, or credit checks to apply. So start your credit journey with Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes and it doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at Chime.com slash baking. That's Chime.com slash baking. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank NA. Pursuant to a license from Visa, USA Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Regular on-time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact to score may vary and some users' scores may not improve. Out of network ATM withdrawal fees may apply, except at MoneyPass ATMs in a 7-Eleven or any All Point or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. I mean, I suppose the primary question is, do you know anyone who's truly happy anymore? Or satisfied? Modern society has smothered our true selves and driven us from biological destiny. I see that version of yourself that you've buried deep inside, that everyone else ignores. That, that is the real you. Caveman. I know that you are the man that you say you are. And then we see Jack welcoming Alice back home after her operations. And she seems like the original Alice from the beginning of the movie. Even Bunny, her best friend slash neighbor is so excited to see her again. I missed you so much, Alice. I started writing gossip in a journal. You did? Well, I should read it then. I'm just so glad you're back. Wow, you look sensational. Thank you. I feel better. I feel... I feel good. I feel so glad to be back. And I'm so glad you're back. Wow, Jack, and look at your new car with your new promotion. Oh, you like it? Yeah, my husband's gonna try to have sex with this car. I just know it. He's gonna try to f this vehicle. Where is your husband, Dean, anyway? He's playing golf with Bill. And Alice turns to Jack. Oh, honey, you should go. All you've been doing is looking after me. You deserve to have some fun. Yeah, go, go, go. Leave her. She's mine now. We're gonna garden. Bunny, you garden? Yeah, we're gonna look at plants and drink, okay? You think I would ever f garden? Come on, let's go. And with that, the girls break out into a laugh. Jack and Alice kiss, and Jack heads off. But right when he touches her lip, she flinches back. It's like she knows something. She's not the same Alice still, even though she's trying. She's sitting with Bunny, gossiping, but things don't feel right. I think even Bunny, Bunny notices because there's a strange look in her eyes. But regardless, Alice must continue her life. She starts cooking and cleaning after that, cooking steak, marinating it, going to ballet class like nothing. You know, that night she has to have dinner on the table waiting for Jack to get home, and um, Jack decides to go put on a record on the record player, and both of them are humming a song. The song that Alice has been humming the whole movie. And she has a flashback. Jack has gone to Dr. Collins to apply for the Victory Project. And Jack doesn't even look like Jack. He doesn't even have the British accent before victory. 
and Dr. Collins reads his application stats. Jack Chambers, applicant 426, psychological evaluation, fair. Age 29, chosen nationality, British. Chosen wife, Alice Warren. Pre-existing relationship, yes. Do you understand the discretion required to be a part of this community? Yes. Do you understand the consequences of indiscretion? Yes. Are you aware you are responsible for preparing your home device system? Yes. Do you consent to the physical and medical requirements for entry into victory? Yes. And are you aware that you are responsible for the physical upkeep of your chosen one? Yes. And are you aware that you must exit the simulation through victory headquarters every day and return only for your allotted number of hours? Yes. And we see that whenever Jack and the other men go to work, they're exiting victory. I'm not just talking physically, but victory is a simulation. It's a metaverse. Mm. It's virtual reality. They go home so they can work a regular job, so they can fund this life of theirs and pay for their stay in victory. And when they go home, they also have to take care of their real life wives slash captives because some of them aren't even their real wives. You don't need a pre-existing relationship in order to marry someone in the simulation. And none of the wives have submitted to this because they're stuck in a simulation constantly. Wow. So it's non-consensual. Wow. They're all hooked up to machines in their home in virtual reality. And when Jack goes to take care of her, he hums that goddamn song for her. Mm. And when he's ready, he will enter back into the simulation, and he hears the woman's voice. Welcome to Victory Project. There are currently 72 active users. Your re-entry has begun. And as he's slipping into virtual reality, Frank's voice, which is why it feels like it's in her head, and they listen to it on the radio. Allow your consciousness to sink deeper. Sink deeper into this world, into the way things are supposed to be. Yikes. And as they're having that song, Alice has this flashback and in the kitchen she drops her roast chicken from the oven and she falls to the ground and she realizes that she's in a simulation. And Jack is like, Alice, are you okay? She's screaming, don't come near me. It's okay, Alice, it's okay. You're just having another episode, babe. Just take a deep breath, it's okay. Just breathe, it's gonna be okay. And Alice slows her breathing and stares up at Jack, the man that she thought that she loved. What did you do? And finally he knows that she knows. Alice, please, just stay calm. Look at me. You're my wife, okay? I love you. <gasps> the banana bread. <laughs> you know, I played a lot of Fruit Ninja, so I don't know why this isn't working. <laughs> Let's see the beautiful side. Are you guys ready for this? Okay. Oh, uh, oh, uh, the sugar uh, didn't come out. That's okay. Uh, Can we see? Oh. Uh, what happened? Uh, oh, the banana got stuck at the bottom? Yeah, the banana got stuck. Wow. Okay, that's okay. I can just put the banana back on. I do not on. recommend this recipe. That's very rude. It's a cool <laughs> recipe. I do not recommend having me bake. Which is funny because I have a whole baking series now. Wow, wow, but it's beautiful, no? It has a vibe. It has a look to it. What do you think, honey? Should we cut it? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna grab a piece of banana, a piece of the bread. Yeah, you eat oh. first. Um, should we get a... Okay. Is it cooked, first of all? Mm. Is it good? Mm. Is it sweet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it taste just like a banana bread? Mm. There's a lot of different textures going on. Better than banana bread? Mm -hmm. It's better. The edges are crusty, but it's moist. The banana adds a fun, mushy texture. Mm. Not bad. Alice is freaking out, panting, running around the kitchen. What the f is happening? And Jack is saying, look, I love you. You're my wife. I love you. I love you. No, you can't say that you don't love me. Don't do that, Alice. Just think. Just think about your life and what you actually want. And Alice looks more scared of him than ever. You're psychotic. I had a life and you took my life. I saved your life, Alice. I saved it. That's not true. You worked all the time. You were miserable. I wanted to work. I loved working. What are, you, what are you saying? You were miserable. You were so unhappy, Alice. You hated your life. It was my life. You don't get to take that from me. And now Jack is pissed. I gave this to you. I gave this, all of you, to Alice, to you. You are lucky to be here. 
Oh wow. my god, this guy is losing his mind, okay? Wow. Frank built this world so we can live the life that we deserve, and I have to leave it every day just to make us enough money to keep us here, and I fucking hate every minute of it. I fucking hate it, Alice. I fucking hate it. You get to stay here, and you're happy. You're happy. We're perfect in here, Alice. Don't you want to be perfect with me? No, you made me feel like I was crazy. I came to you and you made me feel like I was fucking crazy. He gets on his knees. I'm sorry, Alice, I'm sorry. But I, I don't have to lie to you anymore, Alice. Please, I love you. I, you know I love you and I'll do anything for you. You're my whole life. I know. I love you too. And it's not just about where we are, right? It's, it's that we're together. You said that. You said that to me, Alice. And he hugs her while he's on the ground. Alice, I'm so sorry. Oh God, are there other people like me? Where are their bodies? I don't know where they are. I swear. I, I don't know where they are. I don't even know who the men are. It's not our business. A man is responsible for his own wife and nothing else. So all the wives are trapped in here? Oh my god, the kids! Alice starts freaking out. No, 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 Alice, don't freak out. The kids aren't real. Don't worry about them. They're not real. It's just you and me. Just you and me. Look at me. Look at me. Don't worry about them. It's just you and me, Alice. Okay? Stay. It's just you and me. Okay. I know. I just... I just need a second, please. I just need a second. But instead of letting her go, giving her a second, maybe he knows that she's not going to be okay with it. He holds onto her so hard, gripping her so hard, she feels like she's suffocating and she can't breathe. And he won't let her go. And she, she keeps telling him, I can't breathe, please. Just give me a second. I can't breathe. But he's just hugging her harder and harder. And she grabs a cup next to her on the console and smashes it onto his head. And they both knock out. The next thing you know, they're both on the floor. Jack is on top of Alice with blood seeping out of his head, and Bunny walks into the house. Alice? Alice? Oh my god, Alice, what happened? Bunny looks terrified. Bunny covers Jack's body and tells Alice she needs to leave. Meanwhile, Mr. Collins somehow already knows and calls Frank to tell him that Jack Chambers is dead. Is dead? We're getting there. Alice, please, you need to leave. You need to leave now. Listen, you have to go. No, no, I need to tell you something, please. This world isn't real. You need to leave, Alice. They're going to kill you. Please, listen. Frank created a program. He created a world. I know, I know. And they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you in the real world, too. You need to leave. What? What do you mean, you know? They're going to kill your real body in the real world. Go. You need to go. Listen, Alice, if a man dies here, he dies in the real world. Jack can't put you back in the simulation. You're gonna die in the real world too. So she's strapped up in the bed. And if she gets taken out of the simulation, no one's there to feed her. No one's, she can't even get herself out of the simulation because she's strapped, literally like mm -hmm. strapped down. So what can she do? She needs to leave the simulation to try to get out and scream and stuff. So Bunny is strapped? Yeah. What about her? Everyone's strapped. So what's the point who leaves? So if you leave and you're conscious, it's the idea that maybe you can scream for help and try to get out. Why or try to bunny unstrap leave? yourself. She doesn't even know where Alice is, is in the real world. Okay. Right, so now that Jack is dead, okay. I don't know how, there's a plot hole, but he dies in the real world too, if you die in the simulation. Okay, I mean, that makes sense. Because you, yeah. your conscious will never go back yeah. to the real world. Got it. So okay. um, she's like, you need to, you, he can't put you back in like he does every time. You need to exit again right now. Alice, you got to go. Take Jack's car. You got to drive to headquarters. You need to go right now. Bunny, answer me. What do you mean you know? Sirens start blaring outside, coming for Jack. What do you mean you've known? I've always known. I chose this. My kids are here. No, but Bunny, your kids aren't real. But they're real to me in here. Oh. Kids aren't real here, Bunny. No, they are. They're real to me. They're real because at least in here, they're alive. And I don't lose them here. Don't you see? Do they know? What about the other woman? Do they know? No. They don't know. And the sirens get louder and Bunny tells Alice to go. You have to go. How? How does she go? So if she goes to the headquarters, she exits. Like that building, the mm -hmm. glass building. Mm -hmm. Got it. And she walks out in a daze. She's in a white dress covered in blood. All the neighbors are out treating her like a psychopathic neighbor. What is she doing? Oh my God. We have to go back inside. What did you do to Jack? And the wives are told to go back inside and stay away from Alice. But something is drawing them to her. Something they all, I don't know, maybe it's gut. Maybe it's a gut instinct. Maybe they can feel it. And the men are fighting. 
Bill is saying. They said that nothing like this could happen. What the hell is happening? Shut up, Bill. Just go inside and take your wife inside. Everyone get back inside. And Alice starts looking around to see how they can escape. And all the memories are flooding back. Everything Frank said, the men driving in their convertibles, their wives tending to their every needs to have sex with them whenever, however they want to have food ready for them, to wait hand and foot, waiting for, them, for their men to come home from their important jobs that are life-changing. Frank is always saying, we are a brotherhood of brilliance, every single one of us. Whose world is this? And they all chant ours. And Bunny snaps Alice from her trance. Alice, go! She even tackles one of the husbands that try to stop Alice from leaving. And the men in red get there and they start chasing her down. Literally, we're talking about a car chase and pastel convertibles through Palm Springs. Bill is losing his mind in the middle of the street. Please, please, this can't be happening. They said none of this would ever happen. Nothing like this could ever happen. His wife, Violet, looks terrified of him and confused. Meanwhile, Alice is on a car chase out of victory with all these pink pastel convertibles chasing after her. She just has to drive towards the portal where all the men leave for work. And the men in red are catching up to her, but she has to make it out. They're cornering her. They're trying to grab at her because she's in a convertible. But she can almost see the portal. And right in front of her, she sees Dr. Collins' car coming straight for her. And she thinks fast. She realizes she has to stop and break. And she watches as the cars next to her, the men in red, pedal to the metal and collide with Dr. Collins. Which means if they die here, they die in the real world. Meanwhile, Frank is pissed. He's in his mansion le listening to the security breach alerts while his wife Shelly is cutting up fruit. Security level is red. Please stay inside and wait further instructions. Shelly tries to be normal, but she's eavesdropping on Frank's call that just came in. Where is she? Sir, there's been a huge crash. The two lead cars and Dr. Collins crashed. Dr. Collins is dead. Listen to me, you do not let her exit. If she gets through, she gets through, sir. I don't know what to do. Who's gonna put her back in? Jack is dead. Frank, are you there? What do we do, sir? What do we do? Frank looks super pissed and he hangs up the phone and he turns around to spring into action, but Shelly is there and stabs him in the stomach and twist. You stupid, stupid man. It's my turn now. So it seems like Shelly wants to be the new Frank, okay? I don't know. Or maybe she wants to be the new Alice and wants to kill her husband. I don't know. But uh, I guess she realizes men ain't shit. Meanwhile, Alice is driving up the mountain to the headquarters, but her car gets stuck on the uphill drive and she has no choice but to run up barefoot up the mountain to get to HQ. Meanwhile, there's men in red scaling the mountain, running after her, and she's running as fast as she can and she reaches the top and she looks back down and then suddenly Jack appears in her mind and he's hugging her from behind. What? Don't leave me. And she has a flashback of them in bed and she's telling him, you and me. And he says, always, you and me. And that memory, that vision makes her want to stay. But Jack isn't real. He's gone and he's dead and he's not even the one that she fell in love with. And she runs up to the walls and you see her exit the simulation. You just see her put her hands to the walls. Mm -hmm. The screen goes black. And then Frank's voice comes on. Once we acknowledge that reality, we can let go. And we see women cooking, cleaning, tending to their husbands. We see Bunny happy with, happy with her kids. But we also see Alice in the real world. A memory of her having fun, dancing around in her shitty living room, being her. And the screen is black and Alice gasps loudly, implying that she finally made it out of the simulation and Jack is dead. I don't know. It's uh, that's the end of the movie, and mm. it's giving Andrew Tate. <laughs> it's given Andrew Tate the whole men are wired to be men, but women are just not letting us be men. What's that got to do with me? What's that got to do with yeah, me? Okay, it's... what does a woman have to do with you getting a job or not getting a job, or like living your masculine life if you want to be a masculine man? So the, these men really wanted to live those lives. Yes. Just having a wife cook a meal. Yes. And they want to feel important in their job. So they, they really want to wish, they wish that they were born like 60 years ago. 
Yeah. And live that well, old school life. That's the thing. That's what they think 60 years ago is. But you can do that so much more easily now. Like 60 years yeah. ago, yes, I understand it was so much easier to because of inflation, because capitalism wasn't as raging back then. But just in the context of gender roles, it's easier for men to advance today because there's so much opportunity with tech and all these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I don't understand. I think that these are just men who can't live in any time period and be happy because they want people kissing their feet for having a penis. Yeah, it's like they think that women are out there stopping them from living this life and women are just out here trying to survive. We don't even have reproductive rights anymore. So like, what the f do you mean we're stopping men? Like we don't even, we have enough to worry about on our own plate. We got enough going on. And the part where she begged him to leave victory, mm -hmm. it was so symbolic and he refused and he was crying in the car. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like he loves her and he's crying in the car because he knows that he's f***ing her over and he doesn't want her to be in pain. And the idea of her being in pain is painful for him, mm -hmm. but not enough to betray the patriarchy. Because mm -hmm. at the end, the patriarchy benefits him. So even when she says, you know, we can be in our own world together, he can't do it. He can't leave because in the end, he doesn't love her more than he loves his status in the patriarchy. He wants to live this life, and he wants to love her in this life, and that's it. He wants her to be happy, but he has no idea what even makes her happy. And he just assumes that what makes him happy makes her happy. Wow. I thought that conversation was so interesting because it's so true. Like, we like to think, like, good men are the ones that believe, like, yeah, f*** the patriarchy. But then, like, when it's time to show up, they're like, yeah, f*** the patriarchy. And that's it. Then you're like, okay. <laughs> But Jack obviously wasn't even one of the good ones. He was having his girlfriend, the woman he claimed he loved so much, work 30-hour shifts while he was fully capable of finding a job himself, as the movie implies. Like, there was no reason. Like, he was full, able-bodied and everything, right? But he refused. Instead, he stayed home to watch Andrew Tate videos and wanted her to come home to cook for him and have sex with him because he felt like that was his God-given fucking right. Yeah. The other part that stood out in the movie for me were that all the women were really beautiful and all the men were average at best, no offense. And a lot of the couples met the same way on the train to Boston, right? Mm -hmm. And Dr. Collins had asked, is this a pre-existing relationship? So we, it's implied that everyone that met on a train to Boston, oh, those women were abduct abducted. Wow including Violet, because she just felt so disoriented and she never had that hee-hee-ha-ha -ha moments with her husband. See, the messed up part is yeah. if the kids are fake, yeah. that means they can create characters. Yeah. So why can't... That's... Yes! I was reading that on Reddit too that was like, the biggest thing about this is why can't men just put on their little VR headsets and have an AI wife yes. and just stay in AI land yes. by themselves? Yes. I guess that's a plot hole. Yeah, but I guess the problem with that is that if you guys listen to our podcast on Rotten Mango, they would just create AIs of celebrities and yeah. without their consent do nasty things. Honestly, I wish the movie ended with a better clear vision of Alice waking up from the simulation because I think the implications of that would have been wild. I mean, the state she would have been in having been bedridden for I don't know how long, years. Mm -hmm. I highly doubt Jack was taking good of her sanitation-wise or even feeding her nutritious food. How would she even get out of her shackles? Mm -hmm. She was tied to the bed. Yes, yes. You know, I, I, I wish I could see all of that or even see her adjusting to the normal life again. And maybe there's a part of her, because you know how the victim psychology is very intense and it's so complicated and it's so nuanced. I wish to see if there was like a part of her that almost wanted to go back in. Because it was easier and she's kind of fighting with this, like, it would be so much easier for me to just mm -hmm. accept that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And if she's just laying next to a dead corpse, like, what is that? How does that work? I wish there was more of that. But if you ignore some of the plot holes, or like, where do you shit while there's a simulation? Or how are your muscles not atrophying, right? <laughs> and like, you guys are driving in a desert? There's three cars? Why did no one turn in a different direction? I get it, speed is a funny thing, and like, momentum is a thing, but like... I get it, objects that stay in motion, but like, you get it, they, they couldn't have just swerved? Why did they all die? It's weird. I also wish the Shelly concept was explored more. Oh, but I do think it's interesting that the reason that they chose the 50s, because in the real world, it's current time. Mm -hmm. But they chose the 50s because a lot of incel men idolize the 50s. 
Oh in current gosh. culture now because wives would do makeup and hair every day mm -hmm. to stay home cooking clean. See, that's what I'm saying. Like yes. they wish they can live in that time and yes. they love What? That's so bizarre. Yeah. yeah. And they were happy to stay home and be submissive to their husbands. In fact, even the conversation with Bunny in the bathroom when um, during the whole party when he got promoted, being an independent woman was shamed on. It was like you're being selfish for trying to take away from your husband's glory. Yeah, I thought that was strange. Yeah. Like be, you should be happy. Yeah. The most important time of his life. Yeah, I'm like, that's the most important time of <laughs> your life? It so, just sounds so pathetic. Yes. Like you're living for his happiness? Yeah. Ev really everything yeah. sounds so pathetic. And uh, the women are getting dolled up after cooking, waiting for their husbands to come home with a whiskey, like a glass of whiskey. Mm -hmm. And like whiskey is like such a masculine drink. Like let's be real. Most guys I know, they would fucking kill themselves for like a lychee cocktail, okay? <laughs> but instead what? they're like, I'll take a whiskey on the rocks. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure you don't want a sip of my peach bellini? They're like, let me try it, let me try it. I can't even taste the liquor. So good. Can we get, I think she wants another peach bellini, guys. Get out of here. Which side note, this film isn't about dogging on stay-at-home wives. I saw some people on Reddit being like, this is making stay-at-home wives look bad. No. None of these women looked happy. That's the difference. Like when you're in an equal partnership and your partner values, you know, you being stay at home wife, that's fine. But these women were trapped with no free will. They were not equals. Also the earthquakes. People thought it was just noises in Alice's apartment or other people's apartments that they had to factor into VR. Mm -hmm. Like your brain has to come up with a reasoning for it. Yeah. Also when she feels suffocated out of nowhere, it's pro it only happened when, she, when Jack was at work, remember the saran wrap, mm -hmm. the pushing up against the window, mm -hmm. drowning herself in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. So these aren't hallucinations. It's her brain coming up with a scenario in which she would feel this, but in reality, it's Jack suffocating her to keep her under again so that she, her body doesn't come back up consciously. Does that make sense? To keep her in the simulation. What? So in her head, she has to come up with a reason why her body is feeling yeah. like suffocated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why she even calmly, almost as if she doesn't even control her own hands, puts the saran wrap around her face. Um, because your mind needs a reason. I see. I thought she was trying to test herself, see if no, she dies. No. Or this is fake. Okay. It's like your mind literally is that strong. Got it. And it's like, I feel like this is coming. I need to gotcha. give my... You know, also the Gemma, Chan, the Gemma Chan ending. Yes, I love her so much, but I think they did her a little dirty with that ending. I wish they expanded more. The my turn was just blah. Like I wish it was a twist where Frank was never in charge. It was Gemma all along who was trying to profit off incel dudes, but they would never answer to a woman. Or I thought, yeah, that's when she just found out that if someone dies in the game, oh yeah, they, they die, die in, in real, real life. life. Yeah. Like, Oh, so I, if I kill you now, yeah. you actually die. Yeah, I just wish there was more to it. Mm -hmm. I also wish there was a strong like female character behind it that was hee hee hawing in the face of all these men. I thought it would just be cool. Like the irony of all these men worshipping Frank only to find out that Frank is his wife's little bitch baby. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, That's that cool. would have been pretty ironic. Also, the plane crashed. I didn't get that one. That was kind of a plot twist. How did it happen? It's confusing. It happened to push the plot along, I guess. But it just didn't feel well put together in the end. Maybe it was just her mind betraying the illusion or trying to create a situation where she could test the illusion. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. also thought, like, it, there's so many bugs going on in the in yes. the thing, their brain, right? They yes. keep, the memory keep coming yeah. back. That's a huge bug. Like, yeah. how are you not going to fix that? Yeah. Is there not like a reboot button? Instead? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Instead yeah. of like this whole, like, why do they have to like try to give her pills and stuff? Why can't they just press a button and she reboots? Exactly. And then her memories just flow, flow yeah. back even more, which is the opposite of the yeah. treatment. Also, her name is Alice. Ah. And her neighbor's name is Bunny. Ah. Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. huh. That's cool. Yeah. I thought it was really good. I know that there's so many plot holes. It was like a two hour something movie. I think it, as a series, it would have fucking killed it. Mm, like a Westworld? Yes, if there was in-depth series, we saw more into each people's lives. It could have been like a Handmaid's Tale type of vibe. Like WandaVision? Yes, and even the, like I, I don't even think the whole thing should have been in Victory. I think like even in the series, if they just revealed in the middle mm -hmm. that it was a simulation and the constant back and forth of this like mm -hmm. trying to get people out that would have been so fascinating too cool but what are your thoughts cool cool story and uh do you think your boyfriend husband would ever put you in a simulation 
But I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Let me know in the comments and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.